Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 54. Story 1. Howard's Song. The smooth jazz buzzed through his ears as Howard finished correlating the numbers for his latest job. The Baxter account was coming along nicely. Howard felt quite sure that he would have the account books done before quitting time. It had been a hard job, Mr. Baxter had not kept good records, but he had finally chased down all the loose ends and... Howard. Howard cocked his head like a dog that's heard a sound he can't quite place. Had someone been calling him? The smooth jazz he always listened to when he worked was devoid of words. Words tended to distract him while he was working. He shook his head and got back to it, the account was nearly done, and he had a meeting in an hour to finalize it. He'd give his boss something to crow about this time. Charles Baxter was a very wealthy man, and his business would do wonders for the company. Howard bet his boss would give him a bonus after seeing all the excellent work he'd. Howard. Howard turned to look behind him. Someone had said his name, almost spoken it in his ear. As he looked around, he was perplexed as to where it had come from. Looking back to the computer, he began to type again. His nerves a little rattled at the thought of disembodied voices and... Howard. Howard jumped and nearly overturned his chair. Someone had shouted his name, screamed it right into his ear. Even now, as he looked around his home office, he could see no one, though. Howard lived alone, with no wife or children or roommate to distract him, and the thought of someone in his house made him very upset. This was his home, his place of refuge, and as he started to rise from his chair, he resigned himself to search the whole house until whoever was here was found. He had just opened the closet when the voice spoke again. Sorry to startle you, Howard. Now that I've got your attention, I need to talk to you. Howard stared dumbly into the closet. The old jackets and blue storage bins did not begin to speak to him. No one sprang from concealment either to admit to the disturbance, and he came to realize that the voice was not coming from the house. The voice was not an intruder or the disembodied voice of a ghost, which he did not believe in. The voice seemed to be coming from his earbuds. The voice was that of an average, everyday person. Howard could have sat next to him on the bus or chatted with him in line to get his morning bagel. The voice was smooth, educated, and not too terribly unlike his own. This made Howard feel a little easier, a little calmer. As he stood looking into the coat closet, he felt less worried about home invaders and more concerned about why someone in his earbuds knew his name. Wonderful, now that I have your attention, I need you to leave the house. That struck Howard as odd. Not that anything in this situation was expected, but leaving the house. Howard worked mostly from home, always had after his employer had determined that it was better for his productivity. As such, he had maintained a rigorous schedule. He really only left the house to get groceries once a week and to visit a certain woman he liked. Their relationship was based on cash exchange only, of course, but he still had his schedule and liked to stick to it. You are in great danger, Howard. Men are coming to hurt you, men who don't want you to finish this account, and if you are still here when they arrive, I fear you won't live to see tomorrow. This filled Howard with unease. Who was coming to hurt him? Why did they care so much about the Baxter account? I know this must be very upsetting for you, Howard, but I need you to do exactly as I say so I can get you out of this troubling situation. Take all the relevant information you have on the account and put it in your briefcase. Take the hard drive out of your computer, the silver box on the second tray, and put it in there too. You can just yank it right out, it should come free. I need you to do all of this in the next five minutes and be at the bus stop before two o'clock. Get started now. Howard felt himself hesitating. Who was this voice? Why was he talking to him? 
How did he know that this wasn't some trick to get him to screw up all the data on his computer? Still, years of being an accounting drone meant that he had already begun to scoop the papers into his briefcase even as he thought these things over. He was used to following orders and, really, this was just one more in a long line of orders. The side of his desktop came off easily. He had saved his documents, of course, and powered it off. Now he had the case open though, that nagging voice asked him again what he thought he was doing. This was crazy. He was going to yank pieces out of his computer just because a voice in his earbuds told him to. How did he know he wasn't being fooled? How did he know he wasn't having a mental breakdown? For all he knew, he had created the voice, which hadn't spoken in about a minute, and now he was getting ready to break his computer. Quickly now, Howard, they're on their way the voice said, not showing the slightest bit of interest one way or another. He reached in, feeling the heat from the components, and gripped the hard drive. He lifted it out of the cradle, but instead of yanking it, he detached the cables and easily brought the box out. He looked at it as it ticked and cooled and put it in his briefcase. He closed the case, grabbed his hat from beside the door, and left the house. Don't bother locking up, you probably won't be back said the voice in a who cares sort of way, now walk down to the bus stop and sit with the wall blocking your view of the house. Why wouldn't I come back to my house? Howard thought, but he moved to the bus station without really thinking. He was running on autopilot as he came to the bus station and sat down. The longer he sat, and the longer the voice remained silent, the more he doubted it again. A woman with a bratty kid sat next to him, and he clutched his briefcase on his lap. The kid looked up from his gadget, a box that was spewing noise at an ear-splitting level, to tell his mother that he wanted McDonald's when they got wherever they were going. She just patted him and said she would. The kid turned his grubby face back to the gadget then and gave no more thought to the conscious world. That was when Howard saw the car. The black town car drove right past the bus station and then into his driveway. Four men in black suits climbed out and walked towards his door. One of them knocked on the door, three loud clumps, and they all waited for 30 seconds in a state of impatient tension. They all had sunglasses on and shiny black shoes, and Howard thought they looked like government agents in a spy movie. As he peeked around the bus station wall, he saw one of them drive that shoe into his door after not receiving an answer. As they filed, he thought he saw them reach into their coats for something, but the voice came back just a big, silver bus pulled up in front of the stop. Never mind that, Howard. It's not your concern anymore. Just get on and take the bus the number 12 stop. You can do that, can't you? As Howard flashed his bus pass and took his seat, he found that he could. He rode the bus for the better part of an hour. He kept a firm hand on his briefcase, and as he rode, his eyes kept sweeping around to look at the other riders. The bratty boy and his doting mother were a few seats down. The kid hadn't looked up from his gadget since he'd spoken to his mother, and she seemed to be busy watching the world go by. An older woman was sitting up front near the driver, her clothes made him think she might be homeless, and a young man with headphones on was sleeping near the back of the bus. The flashing sign near the front said they were nearing stop number 4. If the stops were in some kind of order, it would be 8 more stops before it was his turn to get off. He glanced out the window as they drove, the bus stopping occasionally but rarely picking anyone up. The voice in his earbuds hadn't spoken in a while. He was again beginning to wonder if he'd made the whole thing up. Here he was, on a bus with his work and hard drive in a briefcase like some kind of spy. Maybe he had been working too hard. Maybe his boss was right, and he really needed to take some time off. I don't want to alarm you, Howard, but it seems that the men in the town car are following you. Howard bristled. He turned his head slightly and could see the black town car in the traffic behind the bus. The windows were polarized so they couldn't see in, but they certainly knew where he was. It would be easy to find him if they came on the bus, he didn't exactly blend in, 
and then what would happen? Would they gun him down on the bus in front of all these people? Would they arrest him? Why were they after him? I need you to get off at the next stop, Howard. Don't hesitate, don't look around, just step off the bus and take the alley to your left. Howard pulled the handle over his head, and when the bus stopped, he calmly walked out onto the busy sidewalk. The doors closed, and the bus rolled on into traffic. Behind it, the town car followed, being none the wiser that he had gotten off. Howard scanned the crowd and found the alley to his left. He took it, clutching his briefcase as he walked among the garbage cans. He didn't see anyone lingering around, and as he came out onto another busy street, he began to relax a little. There was no black town car waiting for him, and that gave him a small amount of assurance. Now cross the street and take the next alley to the number 12 stop. There will be a taxi waiting there for you. Take it to the destination. Howard glanced around, unsure until he finally saw the alley. It sat between an Italian restaurant and a computer repair store. Howard could see the large green dumpster that took up much of the lane and knew it would be a squeeze to get around it. He started across the busy street and was met by the sound of horns honking and people cursing. He hurried across like a frightened rabbit and made the alley before the screeching tires had stopped. The alley was awash with graffiti and the old smell of pasta. Someone had hung some band posters from the wall, but it did little to add to this place's charm. The dumpster was a stinking edifice of green and chrome. Howard was no dainty flower, but he shimmied around it with very little problem. He winced when his stomach rubbed against the filthy dumpster, but he was clear a moment later and nearly out of the alley. Stop the voice said, and suddenly Howard was against the wall. He made himself as small as he could and saw the black town car pull up next to the bus stop. Don't move, just be still, and they won't see you said the oily voice in his ear. The man who had kicked in his door stepped out of the car. He bulged in his suit, a mountain of muscle, and Howard had little trouble believing that the man had so easily booted in his door. He stepped out and walked to the bus stop, the bus Howard had departed pulling up and offloading its few passengers. He looked hard at the mother and brat, the child sticking his tongue at him, and the old lady who shuffled up the street. The bull stepped onto the bus and looked around, exchanging words with the driver, before climbing off. He and a man in a taxi had another conversation, his town car blocking the sidewalk, which ended with the taxi honking and cursing and speeding away. The town car left a few seconds later, and Howard breathed a sigh of relief. A taxi pulled up a minute later, and the driver asked Howard if his name was Howard Kernst. Howard climbed in, and they pulled into traffic. They drove until they hit the city limits. Howard had expected to go uptown to one of the glass edifices that marked the government buildings or the high-scale holdings. He had expected to be greeted by a man in a suit who would tell him that he had done well and explain all this. Instead, they drove into the desert. The driver didn't speak. He just drove. Howard was becoming nervous. The men in the town car had been one thing, but what if the man in the earpiece was worse? He tested the doors and found them locked. He checked the windows and found that they would not open. He tapped on the glass, but the man behind the wheel ignore him. Patience Howard, the man in his ear soothed, all your questions will be answered soon. Howard settled a little, but as they drove deeper into the desert, he began to wonder what was happening. Howard was just an accountant, a great accountant, but still an accountant. Things like this did not happen to you when you were in accounting. You might get a paper cut or stub your toe on an average day but certainly not get yourself involved in clandestine conspiracies or life or death struggles. Hell, the files he had from the Baxter account weren't even that interesting. Baxter owed a lot of money to the government, had a lot of back taxes, but Howard had managed to clear that up. His orders had been to make the problem go away, and he had. When the car stopped, Howard was jerked from his contemplation. They had stopped outside a rundown gas station in the middle of nowhere. 
Howard must have been wool gathering for longer than he thought because the sun was dipping low in the sky behind the gas station, and the afternoon was beginning to sink into the evening. A sensible black sedan was parked in front of the gas station, and as they approached, a man opened the door for Howard and ushered him out. The man was wearing a black suit, much like Howard's pursuers, and his sunglasses reflected Howard's scared face back at him as he climbed from the taxi. The taxi driver accepted an envelope from the man, neither speaking a word, and the cab pulled away, leaving Howard and the man standing in front of the rundown gas station. Right this way, Mr. Kernst said the man, and the two walked towards the station. It was a tatty thing, gas pumps gone all brown and flaky, the glass crashed out in the windows, a single spindle rack spinning sluggishly in the wind with a single bloated magazine on it. Howard had seen a thousand of them in his time, utterly forgettable, and he feared to die in a place like this and become as forgettable as this old station. The thought was sudden, but he couldn't get it loose as soon as he'd thought it. Howard was like a dog who's caught his tail and now can't let it go again. Howard was suddenly sure that this would be the place where he died. The two walked around the back of the station, and there sat a man in a folding chair, a beach umbrella covering him from the sun. He was dressed in a white suit, little blue piping roaming up from the jacket. He had a fat, jolly face, hair the color of snow, and a pair of sunglasses with the same reflected lenses Howard had become used to seeing. He smiled when he saw Howard, and the smile was genuine and warm. He pulled an earpiece out as they approached and spread his pudgy arms wide as though to hug Howard. Mr. Kurst, at last, you have arrived. May I call you Howard? It seems silly to rest on formalities after all we've been through. Howard didn't trust him from the instant he opened his mouth until the end of his life. The man had a showy way of speaking, like a carnival barker or a snake oil salesman. He was the kind of man who turned everything into a Shakespearean presentation. He thought himself a showman, but really, he was just dramatic for the sake of drama. Howard hated people like this. The man seemed to pick up on some of his distaste, I imagine you have a dozen questions, maybe two dozen, and I want to answer them all, but I fear we don't have time. The biggest question I assume you have is why these men are chasing you, yes. Howard nodded, a little sullenly. Well, the answer to that is quite simple. The men are, of course, mine. Yours. Howard asked, perplexed. Of course. You see, if you had something I wanted and there was no sense of urgency, you might start to question the voice that suddenly popped into your head. You might not have come all the way into the desert on my order if I hadn't made the stakes a little high for you. He pulled a cigarette out of a silver case he kept in his jacket, and Howard flinched when he saw the case come free. For half a second, he had seen a small, silver handgun come out of that jacket, and he knew that his life was about to end. The man flipped the case closed but offered it to Howard before he put it away. Howard declined, and the man slid it back into his pocket with some disappointment. The man who had escorted him from the taxi stepped close, flicking an expensive lighter and holding it to the end. Howard considered running into the desert while they were occupied. Catching a bullet in the back, however, did not seem much better. Now then, the man said as he exhaled a mouthful of smoke, I imagine you'd like to know why we want those papers you have in your briefcase. Well, that's a little more complicated. You see, Charles Baxter has made some very important people very angry. He has made enemies out of the kind of men who don't get mad, only even, and in 72 hours, he will cease to exist forever. He will be erased from life, erased from memory, and erased from time. Howard gaped. Who was this guy? How exactly did you go about erasing someone from time? Charles Baxter was a fat cat around here, probably one of the most prominent businessmen in three states, but surely he was small potatoes in the grand scheme of things. Right? So, as you can see, it's very inopportune for you to have files that prove that this man existed at all. 
Charles Baxter is already dead, his associates are, as we speak, being ferreted out. You, Howard, are the last loose end that needs to be tied up. But, but why kill me just for having this information? The man shrugged noncommittally, because it's easier than having you reprogrammed. At the end of the day, you're an unmarried accountant whose absence will go unremarked. You have no family, no real friends, not even any pets to mark their bowl's emptiness. You have lived an unremarkable life, Howard. Your death will be much the same. He threw the cigarette into the sand half-smoked and held his hand out towards Howard. Now then, the case, please. It was said nice enough, but Howard knew that it wasn't a request. The man was used to giving orders and having them followed, and for a moment, Howard thought about refusing him. He would die here, he knew that, but maybe he could die with some dignity. Perhaps he could die having fought against something that didn't seem right. He held onto the case for a few seconds, not sure what he meant to do, but in the end, he found himself handing the case to the man under the umbrella. At the end of the day, he was just an accountant, after all. The man accepted the case, smiling, and this time the hand that came out of his suit coat did contain a small silver handgun. Thank you, Howard. You have been very helpful. The gun went off, and Howard felt the slug enter his body. It burned for a few seconds, and then he felt nothing. Howard's life ended in much the same way he had lived it. Without much fuss. Story 2. The Statue Cats. Grandma Diane always loved cats, her home had four beautiful cats, she never went overboard with animals and was once a veterinarian at an animal adoption center. Her grandson, Luke, loved her dearly as, when his parents kicked him out of their house, his two grandmas were there to give him a place to stay. Grandma Diane's birthday was coming up and Luke really wanted to get her something special, but all the good pet stores were closed. He felt as miserable as a storm cloud, as he slouched down on a bench in a small playground. He knew that even if he wrote a simple card his two caretakers would be happy, but he wanted to give them something special this year, since his company finally paid him. He sighed not noticing the young kid running up to him. Hey mister the kid said, look at this cool toy I got. Luke smiled, he loved how little kids would show their toys to complete strangers. He watched as this monument of joy showed him a wooden cat-sized statue, the name Storm ingrained in a wooden piece of metal, where did you get this bud? He could care less but he was enjoying this child's momental joy. The child pointed at a person, Luke didn't know what gender they were, selling cute cat statues. He decided to walk over to them, maybe his grandparents would like a cat statue. He read some names of the remaining cats, could I get Cassidy? He asked, they responded unfortunately I am not letting anyone buy Cassidy, without her girlfriend Lucky, but I can offer you 50% off on Lucky. It's a deal, how much would that be? $45 he pulled out his crisp green dollar bills more exited about the inclusiveness, than the deal. Cassidy was in a sitting position, eyes wide and curious, he hadn't noticed before but all the statues had cartoony faces, Lucky had a big welcoming smile with a four-leaf clover on her neck. He rushed home to wrap them. Today was Grandma Diane's birthday, Luke and Grandma Jane had gotten gifts for her. She loved Jane's oven mittens, but especially loved Lucky and Cassidy. She even had fun reading the descriptions at the bottom, Lucky the black cat is a good luck charm, she likes to give luck to those who are kind and the greatest amount of luck has been given to Cassidy the cat. Cassidy the cat is a defender, she has friends who help her. She pays kindness with kindness and hostility with hostility. Never be afraid she put them on top of a shelf in the front room, when the doorbell ringed, Luke dashed to answer it. Luke stared in disbelief at his parents, their eyes judging his every movement. Luckily Grandma Diane was braver than him. What do you two want she snapped angrily, we just wanna be here for your birthday. They responded as sweetly as their sour hearts would let them, unfortunately Diane wasn't buying it, 
stay away from me and my dash Luke's father pulled out a gun and aimed it at Diane, before walking forward, pushing Diane into the house. Listen here, you don't own him, we do, if we don't get him back, we will force him back Luke's dad had a sinister grin. You have made a grim error, an anonymous voice stated, Luke realized Cassidy was gone and Lucky had a worried face. Then sounds of his mother struggling to breath, when he looked over a bigger anthropomorphic version of Cassidy was holding his mother by the neck karma caught up it said. A sinister cartoony smile plastered on its face. The mom's face was going pale, the dad shot at the creature, making it look mad. Its arm reached over and picked him up by his head, he struggled. Cassidy left the room chuckling, before, out of view a loud chomp sounded and the horrified screams of the mother echoed. Story 3. No job ever chooses me. Jobs never search for me or pick me and I need a job straight away. I wish that I could just pick a job of my choosing but unfortunately it's the job that chooses you. I have a family to feed and we have been relying on charity. I don't want to rely on charity anymore and I am sick of seeing jobs float by me and pick others instead of me. Like when a builder's job chose Yamaha, there were builders clothes and equipments that were floating in the air and they forced themselves onto Yamaha. Yamaha was ungrateful and didn't want the builder's job as he wanted to be a computer programmer. Yamaha what an ungrateful fool and he tried taking off the builder's clothes but he couldn't as the job chose him. Then when a bank receptionist job was floating by there was a suit, a calculator and a debiting check floating by in the air. I tried shouting at the banking reception job to pick me and it stayed still in the air and was observing me but decided not to have me. It's like my desperation disgusted jobs and when it picked Olahi, I was enraged with jealousy. As the banking receptionist job went towards Olahi, Olahi begged the banking reception job not to come towards him. What an ungrateful prick as I needed a job and no job would pick me, and so I beat Olahi to death and the banking reception job went away. Then when a taxi driver job was floating in the air, it was a taxi car floating in the air and it was going towards Palahi. Palahi was begging the taxi driver job not to come towards him as he had dreams of becoming a businessman and I was so desperate for a job that I murdered Palahi and put his blood on my face and wore his clothes. The taxi driver job thought I was Palahi and it picked me and I was inside the taxi car. I was able to make some money with Palahi in the boot of the car. When his body decomposed too much the taxi driver job knew that I wasn't Pulahi and went away from me. Then when a chef job was floating in the air, a chef's uniform and knife were floating in the air toward Irahi. Irahi begged the chef job not to come towards him and I was so angry at him for being ungrateful at not wanting the chef job. It's an honor when a job chooses you and so I grabbed Irahi and forced him to stay still for the chef job to take him. Then my family were floating in the air towards a man called Samlai I and it was his job to look after my family. He didn't want it but it went to him and I am still here with no job ever choosing me. This marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. See you until next time.